proliferation, two, disarmament, and three, uh, the right to peaceful use of nuclear technology. And those of you familiar with physics will know a three-legged structure is supposedly uh, the strongest of all. I mean, it's not necessarily four legs, but three. But anyhow, with regard to these three legs, different parties emphasize one or the other of the legs. That is, the nuclear powers, uh, generally the haves, emphasize non-proliferation. The non-nuclear states, largely developing countries, uh, underscore uh, disarmament. And others, uh, perhaps the wannabes, and some would say that Iran, for instance, right now could be seen by some as wannabe, uh, would emphasize the right for peaceful use of nuclear technology. Now, the treaty has 190 or so parties, uh, uh, including all the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council. However, some significant new nuclear powers, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, remain outside the treaty. And India and Pakistan have long argued that the treaty is inequitious, it's unequal, and perpetuates the, uh, 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 the dichotomy between the haves and the have-nots. Now, all these powers are Asians, and today this is happening on the matrix, on the matrix of a rising Asia, rising in economic, political, cloud, etc. in varied fields. So obviously these have ramifications for the NPT. What are these ramifications? How can we accommodate the principles of NPT with the security aspirations of these powers? Now to speak, speak to this uh, very important issues, these important issues we have here, the ambassador of France to Singapore, Son Excellence, Monsieur Olivier Caron. And uh, to him and to all of you, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, I bid a very warm welcome on behalf of ISAS. Ambassador Caron is professionally and intellectually uh, adequately, in fact, fully equipped to address this, uh, this subject uh, aptly. Uh, having graduated from the prestigious L'École Nationale d'Administration in Paris in 1986, he joined Quai d'Arcy and served as a French diplomat in many parts of the world. Uh, he, his specialty is strategic affairs and disarmament, and he served with distinction uh, both in the uh, ministry, uh, foreign ministry, as well as in the Prime Minister's office. He has also been the governor of France to the IAEA. Uh, he joined his present assignment uh, in Singapore in 2009. It is with great pleasure that I will now give him the floor. He will speak for 30 minutes or so, and thereafter we will have a 20-minute Q&A, following which there will be a team reception. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for, for these kind of introductory words, and, uh, and thank you for uh, assembling this audience. I'm very grateful to be here to be able to, uh, to address uh, this issue of the NPT and related issues, which indeed have constituted a large part of my uh, career in the foreign ministry and otherwise, and I have always taken a very keen personal interest. So I'm very, very happy to be able to continue to engage in this, uh, in this, uh, this in discussing these issues with different audiences, and especially to uh, engage this issue with audiences in Asia, where, as you quite rightfully pointed out, uh, much of uh, what is at stake with the NPT regime per se is uh, playing out. Also, very grateful because uh, this also confirms one of the uh, when I make so to speak the strategic choice of having an interest 
in the summit on the proliferation issues, I had a hunch that this was a good recipe to have a job for life. So that's a confirmation of this uh, confirmation of this uh, of this function. This function. So uh, this is a very challenging task to uh, to be able to try to uh, to provide a a objective uh, objective uh, account of NPT related issues when you have been intimately involved in many negotiations at NPT platforms or NPT uh, review conferences, having spent, spent a lot of time at the IAEA grappling with a number of issues, such as, for instance, the Iranian proliferation crisis, civilian nuclear development issues, which are also a very important part of the IAEA's work. But I think, um, so to keep straight, things uh, straightforward and simple, I think I will address this point in three main blocks of issues, which I will hope stimulate uh, our thoughts in later on in discussions. First point I will try to, to I will uh, sort of taking stock, uh, taking stock part of this, uh, of this talk, take stock of the accomplishments and the present status of the NPT, which is a backdrop to the whole discussion. And try and try to highlight and evaluate what are the true challenges for the future, and then wrap it up in highlighting specific considerations for Asia with the NPT regime and system overall, and from Asia. As, as you mentioned, much of what to the NPT will play out in this region. And I'll try to highlight a few things which I think can uh, point to a direction for the future. First, taking stock, where is the NPT itself today, and where is the NPT-related system, the system that really gravitates around NPT? Of course, we have always qualified. This is the stable phrase that you hear about the NPT, uh, the cornerstone of international security, disarmament, and non-proliferation, etc., etc. What does it mean? Has it always been the case? I think to start a bit uh, with a bit of historical perspective, it was to realize that the birth of the NPT initially stemmed from a uh, Russian Soviet American initiative backed by the United Kingdom. So, what does this uh, combination of, uh, of actors and forces mean? Well, one has to recall that the initial, at least one big motivation for the NPT, for the NPT initiative per se, was, or I will quantify it maybe half, a third, whatever, was an instrument to help manage the strategic competition between the USA and the USSR. And in order to secure this basic instrument to manage this strategic competition with the arms race, which was going on very strong at the time, of course, you had to inject broader goals, or loftier goals, universal, universal goals to achieve international consensus. But one has to see that the NPT was concluded at a time when there were always already parallel initiatives undertaken by the Soviets. Americans at curbing nuclear weapons development according to their own interests. And this was the partial test ban treaty. We had the first attempts at managing uh, the, the arsenals. So there was a whole complex of initiatives that at first time would, that time was geared first and foremost towards managing the strategic competition. And, Students of diplomatic history, there's one very interesting uh, thing, a very interesting speech to read. It is a speech of the French ambassador at the UN at the time, uh, who explained at that time that France would not be joining the NPT. It was precisely because it was an instrument designed by the USSR and the USA to manage their strategic competition. We felt at that time, 
goal is to appear, but of course it was not consist consistent with our interest. One also has to recall that at that time, the ratification among allies was not a debate, at least among American allies. The Soviet allies was a different position at that time. And uh, we had some debate, when you look at the historical records, we had discussions about whether the king in Europe, where there had been some budding of the program, so in Europe, there were discussions about the wisdom of this instrument. And that is, at the end of the day, this treaty managed quite successfully to fulfill this objective. Kennedy's famed prediction that the chapter of 30 new government states in the years by 20 years was not realized, and it established a norm of sorts, not wholeheartedly accepted, not universal, of course, but a norm nonetheless, as is an important reference. Then there was a morphing and transformation of the APT system in the 1990s. Uh, three factors contributed to this morphing and transformation of the APT. First, Iraq, the Iraq issue, <coughs> first uh, led, well, re realization was put into full light, something that, many, that, that everybody knows, but which is always unpleasant to find out, to, 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 to materialize, the realization that treaties could be reached with, of course, with the discovery of the clandestine Iraqi program with its military aims. Well, it was a different secret from that of course Iraq, which well, there was no established breach, but in 1991 there was an established breach of, of, of uh, the obligations which were documented after its inspection took place. So it was a very, very a topical moment, a important moment that showed that um, treaty members did violate key obligations. One has also to recall that at the time there was also violations of biological weapons treaty, but there was a whole backdrop of violations of important international obligations, which uh, led to very important uh, diplomatic initiatives. The end of the Cold War, at least the event, which is known as the end of the Cold War, quote unquote, also uh, de emphasized the uh, strategic competition management component of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That was not the principal motivation, at least, it's the motivation that at least faded away a little bit, because the strategic competition at least took, if not what well, was first, of course. Uh, faded in by itself, or took different forms, that, that was not anymore a purely a mainly bilateral Russian matter. But it changed the, uh, the discussion to two, two, two uh, different issues, which were universality, in quotes, and compliance. And the compliance, of course, is linked to the uh, issue of the violations. Uh, of, of, um, of safeguard and treaty obligations. Universality is the key word to inject the considerations of regional conflict and, situation and, and considerations into the multilateral mechanism that is uh, the NPT. And in, in the 1990s, all of these issues came to a head with uh, the 1995 uh, review conference of the FPT, which achieved very significant results in several fields. Silent, of course. I'll come back to that later. A little bit later on, disarmament, non proliferation, and, and the injection of regional security considerations in. NPT discussions. All this culminating into the indefinite extension of the NPT, which was decided in 1995, which was not necessarily easy to achieve, as we all recall, but which was nevertheless sort of high, high watermark. 
for the natural system. Um, little note on this, on, on this count, in 1995, the indefinite extension of the NPT hinged, of course, partially on the issue of the Sabonet, which was hotly disputed. But the real potential <coughs> deal breaker for the extension in 1995 was not the Sabonet, which was Sought, but was released. The released issue is the issue that almost we made it. We made it with a decision that, uh, that uh, associates the extension of the NPT with a decision of the released. But that was the key last minute element which helped achieve the goal that uh, was set out initially in 95 to extend the NPT for an indefinite period. So this period was uh, somewhat paradoxical. In the 1990s, we achieved major breakthroughs, extension, plus American, Russian, arms reduction measures. That was the time, for instance, when uh, uh, the United States decided to reduce tactical weapons and remove it from the, major, from the majority of the locations. It was also the time where France decided to cut one whole leg of its triad, doing away land-based missiles. This was also the time where France decided to stop and then dismantle its fissile materials production facilities for weapons. <coughs> it was also the time where the uh, treaty CTBT prohibiting Nuclear testing was concluded in 1996. Beyond the specific nuclear related matters, it was also the time where a new spirit of international cooperation between former adversaries allowed the conclusion of instruments such as, for instance, chemical weapons treaty, or which ushered in efforts reinforce the implementation of the biological weapons convention. It was a high tech period. Also a time of course as we know, a nuclear program in South Africa was dismantled as well as uh, Ukraine when uh, the Soviet Union came to the song. At the same time, the paradox that at the same time these major achievements were uh, logged. It is also this, at this very period that the Iranian clandestine nuclear program started to gather momentum. And of course, this was also the time, the end of the 1990s, when you had the nuclear tests in India and Pakistan, and also time, at the end of this very favorable period, the time when the United States Senate rejected ratification of this the CTBT. Just happened just after I left my political major course of the relation. So so this contrasted period, a short period of high water marks high extreme success followed by real challenges I think through the backdrop to the to the uh, to the challenges which we are going to face in the future and they have not fundamentally changed in nature although they may change in shape and geographical ambit so what are these main challenges for the future 
how do you weigh them? Well, the first challenge, I'll be very clear on this, uh, very, uh, you won't be surprised to hear me uh, uh, highlight this point. The principal challenge is compliance. And of course, this means the issue of Iran. The Iran dossier has the potential to initiate in the region of the Middle East, which is West Asia. What would be the effects of a breakout, Iranian nuclear breakout? The first effect I won't get into the speculations, but the principal effect that you could, you could see first, first in regional terms, is that the possible sanctuarization afforded by nuclear weapons capability could afford Iran at least partial cover to pursue regional policies, which we don't think would be in the overall interest of the region of the international community. There is no guarantee that counter-assurances that can be offered would suffice to convince other regional actors not to go down the weapons route. So you have the cascade in terms of security considerations, you have the cascade in terms of emulation. Third, and all this means that beyond the specific consideration of the region itself, it could represent, it could represent a loss of confidence overall for countries everywhere that have entrusted their security in the integrity of the NPT system. So we have regional applications, which would be very strong, of course, but also systemic, more systemic uh, implications, which, go, which would go beyond the region. So we go from regional nexus of security to a broader systemic risk. Not that it means that having a breakout in this context would mean that somebody else on the other side of the planet would decide to develop the weapons, but it would usher in an er erosion of norms and of confidence in the multilateral system with possible rebound effects for non-proliferation, including in, in Asia. I'll come to that in the third part of the presentation. This is why we have devoted such efforts since 2003 to address and resolve this issue. I personally witnessed several attempts to establish a dialogue, including a sweeping offer in 2008, which was rejected. At the same time, which is important to register also, is that the international cooperation, by and large, on this issue, held on, even if it even if it's, uh, was not very always very easy to get agreements between France, UK, Germany, China, but at the end of the day, we made it. And why did we make it? Because nuclear proliferation, and I think that's basically what it's the crux of the NPT consensus, quote unquote, that at the end of the day, nobody, it's not a zero sum game, not a zero sum game. Nobody can expect to lose less than the others from the nuclear arm Iran. And that let's keep the initiative going. The second underlying, second major challenge for the future is um, the likely expansion of nuclear power even after the uh, Fukushima issue, which is going to result in the slowing down of uh, new nuclear build initiatives with reduced impetus certain time lag due to the 
reduction of enhanced safety considerations, or economic considerations, expansion of shale gas also, which will put off certain projects, especially in the US, by the way. The <coughs> nuclear power will be part of the energy mix in the future with regard to car carbon free energy agencies, which means that long term, this will be inevitable, there will be a continued push towards more, not only nuclear power generation facilities, but also more fuel cycle facilities. Fuel cycle facilities are inherently, or technologies, facilities, we can, we can discuss the technical details, but the technologies are inherently dual use challenge will be in the future with an expanded recourse to nuclear power in the world, we have to ensure fuel services, broad-based fuel services, without contributing to proliferation. And this is certainly an issue which is key to the second plank, this other plank of the key which you mentioned, which is uh, peaceful use. The third challenge, which I see important, is as a key, as a key challenge, is to maintain what I would qualify as a realistic momentum on the summit. Of course, the summit is always, for anyone who has served the conference on the summit, the summit is, of course, one of the most. Uh, charge, politically charged issues uh, that you can, can address in international forum as a key component of the NPT bargain, I would say. But I believe that we are, at the moment, facing a situation where one realizes that the disarmament, the disarmament process cannot be secated from strategic regional and internal context. And it is interesting to see that while well, the summit was in many review conferences of the NPT a breaking point issue as it was for us in 2005. In 2010 and the 2010 review conference it was handled relatively, relatively of course, consensually. So there's good, there are good grounds to uh, rekindle a disarmament process if you look at the issue in the right angle. And what is the right angle of the issue? Well, the first, in order to understand to be able to conduct a serious discussion on uh, assignments, you know, have to know what you're talking about. What is the object? Which means that it is a critical issue to have more transparency. Reporting obligations, stating who has what. We are pretty comfortable with that because we have already declared our arsenal less than 300 weapons, which is, by the way, minus 50 percent in 10 years. Um, so we'd be very glad to have uh, this uh, move towards transparency being universalized among nuclear weapons holders. Transparency also requires consistency about what you describe. So it requires consolidation of existing arrangements, treaties, for instance, the Russian American treaties, New START treaty, to understand what is deployed 
not deployed because it doesn't, doesn't mean the same thing. I have X weapons which are deployed. If I have two or three times more as much in the drawer somewhere, we declare the whole thing. And the third point which we have to address is also to include the vectors. Because at the end of the day, it is the vectors, the delivery systems, which count. This is why the EU and the French, uh, under the French initiative, has proposed to negotiate an international treaty on intermediate nuclear forces. Rockets. The challenge is also to consolidate instruments outside the NPT which contribute critically to its goals, which means the um, implement, ratifying and implementing the uh, Nuclear Weapons Test Ban Treaty, CTBT, and of course the Fissile Materials Cut-Off Treaty, which is a key plank for the Sarabot. The Fissile Materials Treaty means very simply that no state will be able to produce more nuclear material or weapons. It's not a concern for us, we have dismantled facilities. But this would be a very key element in the uh, consolidation of the NPT uh, regime. So what are the specific implications for Asia, writ large, and what will be the role of Asia, participation of Asia, in these challenges which face the NPT overall? Well, first, just to restate the obvious, it's, uh, it is the two extremes of the Asian continent that harbor the two most, the two most acute proliferation crises, i.e. TPRK and Iran. Of course, these two crises are not of the same nature. I already mentioned Iran, so we'll go back to it. And the strategic context is different. We have fewer regional actors in Northeast Asia who have a different framework to address the issue, the six party framework talk, which is a bit different from the Iran six quote unquote framework. And there is a different strategic landscape and a different relationship to the major players. But the conjunction of this uh, DPRK issue and the Middle East, uh, with the DPRK being a specific situation that it has carried out documented nuclear tests, poses a risk, security risk to Asia itself in several respects. I think one of the main risks is the potential for sensitive technology dissemination, either on commercial, quote unquote, grounds or for other motivations, but which is certainly a key uh, danger uh, that, uh, that, implicit, that resides in this situation. We have already witnessed the global, regional, regional and then global ramifications of the AQ count network, as we remember well. And this is a serious issue in that you have an ongoing potential risk of technologies applicable to weapons going and touring in the, in, the, in the region with certain connections which are uh, which can be uh, quite worrisome. As you recall, the uh, Syrian reactor that was bombed in 2007 was bearing a very uncanny resemblance to, young, to the Yongbyon plutonium producing reactor in North Korea. So the connections are regional and of course they have a have systemic, more systemic implications. Of course, as a side issue, this issue of Northeast Asia has a critical impact on the prospects of stabilization and peace on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, it's a critical challenge for the ability of major players to cooperate to address the problem. So basically what is playing out in Asia is the issue of universality and of course the specific dimension of 
South Asia, say, India and Pakistan, which have not joined the treaty. Now, speaking of universalization, uh, universalization is a regular staple call of international conferences. Most recently, the NPT Review Conference in 2007, United, the United Nations Security Council resolution in 2009 after the nuclear security summit, you will always find a call towards universalization. Well, we know that these calls are addressed to countries that we know won't be likely to sign, to sign up the treaties just after reading the resolutions, to say the least. But it does mean that the aspirations and the objectives encapsulated the NPT remain key reference points for the international community. It's no reason, it's no reason not to continue to subscribe to them and to continue to work towards them, uh, even if you know it's not going to be fulfilled tomorrow morning. And in turn, and this is no reason, no reason to surmise that nothing can be done because if you don't have a uh, sort of international reference, an international objective. You cannot organize initiatives around uh, complementary initiatives. And on the contrary, I would argue that there are, at the present time, very significant prospects and positive elements for Asia in the NPT environment, where Asia is making a contribution, and upon which Asia will be a critical actor in the future. Let me uh, mention a few points now to end off uh, today. The first point of which I think is very critical, where Asia plays a very critical role, is the issue of nuclear weapons free zones. And more specifically, uh, the Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zones is a key component of the non-proliferation architecture writ large. So there are five, uh, five nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zones is a great achievement of ASEAN since 1995. And what remains to be done is the adherence of the five nuclear weapon states, all five nuclear weapon states, to the protocol of we call Shanghai's for to keep it simple pending clarification of key issues, especially linked to the interpretation of the implementation of the provisions of the law of the sea convention. And in this regard, I'm quite confident that progress has been made on this front, and the prospects for all P5 to join the protocol to the Bangkok Treaty are good. And this would be a major achievement for the preparation of the 2015 <coughs> NPT Review Conference, the preparation of which, the, uh, the, prepared, the, uh, the preparation of which is starting <coughs> this year. If this Treaty of Bangkok Protocol is finalized, this would be a major contribution from Asia to the NPT system writ large. Also note that the participation of Asian states in the proliferation security initiative is significant. It's important, very important because Asia has the most trading area in the world now and the major beneficiary of an open trading system stands most measure to benefit of robust measures to prevent to prevent the abuse 
for proliferation purposes of the open trading system. We're all attached. We might need to explain the PSI a bit. Yes, the Proliferation Security Initiative is this initiative which, wants, which was launched by the US, where countries subscribe, uh, commit to uh, detect and prevent illegal shipments of proliferation sensitive materials. That is a key component of the. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate on the whole export control <coughs> of the NPT, but that's uh, we'll complete later on. Around in the environment of the NPT, we also have things, issues which are not directly NPT, uh, NPT within the purview of the NPT, but which are related to the same general goals. For instance, the Nuclear Security Summit initiated by the Americans, and which is chaired by the Republic of Korea in 2012. Of course, it's a different issue from proliferation per se, but this kind of initiatives allow for multilateral discussion and cooperation on sensitive nuclear issues. You cannot address, of course, the crux of the matter, that is who joins or doesn't join the NPT, but you organize and you usher in habits of cooperation between states that would not necessarily speak easily to nuclear issues, but which gain some sort of easiness, confidence, addressing very sensitive issues within themselves. Also, I would like to um, mention another point. India is moving closer to the nuclear suppliers group. Of course, the issue is not resolved yet. As you remember, the nuclear suppliers group, which is the export control wing, so to speak, of the NPT regime, was for very long contested uh, by India on principal grounds. Now, India adheres, stated its wish to it, its, uh, well, its practical adherence to the guidelines of the nuclear suppliers group. It is nuclear supplier in the first place. That it has an interest in uh, fulfilling and upholding uh, the principles and the objectives of the uh, nuclear surprise group. <coughs> it might also be joined at some point. So the situation has been, even if you're not a member of the NPT, there's a whole nexus, a whole uh, uh, network of uh, fora, regimes, cooperation platforms which create uh, the, uh, the impetus for new international cooperation. And I'll conclude on that. International nuclear issues are in a very specific category in international security diplomacy in two respects. First, of course, the stakes are exceptional. So no need to belabor the point. Going to the very core of international peace and security, but precisely because the stakes are so exceptional, international nuclear issues can also be an exceptional spur to cooperation for ambitious initiatives. Remember what happened in Europe in the 1950s, Euratom. Euratom uh, is the uh, stated objective, uh, encapsulates this, the, uh, uh, a stated European policy of putting together nuclear resources for peaceful purposes, of course, and managing them jointly, irrespective of whether you have nuclear power yourself or not. But for instance, they allow for cooperation on materials control, which is a key component, of course, of the non-proliferation system, and of course of safety, which is a very, very topical and important issue nowadays after Fukushima. So I remember that some years back there was there were ideas that were uh, touted or floated to promote something that would be called like an Asia Tom, that is a, uh, <coughs> a multilateral nuclear cooperation firm for Asia. Well I don't know where this stands now, I think it's uh, I think it's in the field of uh, very very lofty ambitions for the moment. But 
I think also that thinking about these issues, having nuclear issues concentrate regional cooperation, is some things which pushes countries into going to thinking ahead even more than with them, much further they would have done with, uh, with other issues. That's my hunch. So uh, definitely Asia is certainly the region of the world. There's a lot of Asia where, of course, you still have very strong uh, universality and PT uh, universality issues, of course, compliance issues, and which is the main continent for the prospects of your resilient nuclear power. I think Asia is certainly the area of the world where you will need to deploy the most imagination to resolve these issues. I've been a bit too long, I'll stop now. No. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador Carton. That was uh, a very good presentation, an important one, but uh, also very stimulating. I will uh, now open the floor for uh, for uh, Q&A, question and answer. Two by two, you will identify yourselves. I, I recognize the first two, but I'll leave it to you to identify yourselves and then pose the question. This is for the record, of course. That's it. Ambassador, thank you very much for that. I'm a Raja Mohan, and I'm a visiting professor at the SIS uh, from India. Uh, of course, I, I thought I'd just make a few points. And one on the, the universality. I think when the Middle East countries are pushing for them, it largely comes from them. Uh, it's largely about Israel and very little about India and Pakistan. Because for them, it's, it's been the Egyptian initiative from the beginning uh, to, to capture Israel in some form. Uh, so, uh, and I don't think uh, it's really about India or Pakistan. And as far as India is concerned, I, mean, I think, uh, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, India's new engagement with the non-proliferation system as opposed to the team. Uh, India's, I think India's position is much like France uh, between 68 and uh, 92 when we joined the NPT, that though we are not a signatory to the NPT, we would like to behave and uh, uh, practice uh, the, all the core obligations that arise from signing the treaty. Uh, my sense is that I don't want to get into this north-south arguments, uh, you know, much of the uh, issues that are usually raised from, from Asia. But I think the three fundamental problems uh, today uh, in relation to Asia and the NPT, uh, those could be the extra challenges that you might want to deal with. First, I think you refer to the nuclear free zone. No, I think there is a, if there was a, an illusion in Southeast Asia that by passing a declaratory measure, uh, you can exclude Chinese and American nuclear forces from the waters of Southeast Asia. That's probably the principle of that. But when the Chinese are claiming the whole of the waters, uh, contesting the law of the sea in terms of uh, innocent passenger military vehicles, I think you have actually a situation where the desire, the expressed desire of Dacia is completely uh, at odds with what's going on on the ground. Uh, so I don't see how the, 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 as the Chinese nuclear maybe expands, uh, the Americans try to deal with it, uh, you would find a very messy situation in South China Sea. And that can't be solved by a nuclear free zone. I think there are larger set of issues. The second problem in Asia, I think, is, uh, is that one reason why NPT has held for so long in Asia uh, was the fact that there is US extended vigilance. Now, if the US is seen as too weak, uh, everybody's talking about US decline today, uh, how credible are the American extended vigilance arrangements with Japan, South Korea, Taiwan? Now, in the context of rise of China, uh, if that sense that US is on the decline or cannot sustain uh, its commitments to Asian allies, that will be the biggest challenge for the future of NPT and not uh, you know, the smaller ones that, that, have been, that have been going on for, for a long time. And the third and final point is the real problem with NPT is there is no enforcement mechanism. Uh, that is, uh, that you have still to go to the UN Security Council to punish somebody who is violating NPT. There again, the problem is American weakness. That if North Korea and Iran are convinced that the emperor has no clothes, and that UN Security Council can pass any number of resolutions, but there is no military power to back it, particularly since what happened in Iraq, where France was among the leaders opposing the intervention, that given the situation where the US is so weak, and uh, that it cannot really compel North Korea to roll back, or Iran to give up, but then the real problem for the system is going to be the American weakness uh, rather than the American unilateralism. Because if the US is seen as going down, China is seen as going up, 
Maintaining the system, I think, is going to be far more complicated. Well, okay, uh, we we'll have a basket. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Ojin, uh, South Korean ambassador. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Chalbi, and thank you, uh, Like you said, I also worked on these issues quite a while before coming to Singapore. And I think your uh, presentation was very timely and very enlightening. Just one question uh, regarding your uh, three points challenges to NPT. I totally agree with you, those are all important challenges. But uh, uh, even Dr. Chowdhury in his initial uh, introduction, uh, he said something like, uh, all of us, all the countries in the world are parties to NPT, except for uh, four countries. But mixing North Korea with the other three is a little uh, confusing, misleading, I mean. And also, this is one important issue uh, being discussed in the NPT every review conference. Because, as you pointed out, when they came up with the NPT in 1967, three pillars, so called three pillars. So we sort of freeze nuclear weapons as of 1967. Those already have who already have nuclear weapons by 1967, they can keep having nuclear weapons. Those who didn't will not pursue nuclear weapons. Instead, uh, those who have will pursue disarmament in nuclear And uh, those who have technologies will transfer technologies to those who don't have uh, on the condition that they will not pursue nuclear weapons. The this is basically what nuclear NPT is about. Then, once, once you join NPT, South Korea has 20 nuclear power plants right now. We were able to have the technology to develop nuclear reactors because we joined NPT. Actually, when we decided to have nuclear power plant, our president asked around and they said, well, if you want to have nuclear technology, you should first join NPT and also under IAEA safeguard. So that's what we did. So did our North Korean brothers. So they were able to get uh, uh, nuclear technology because they joined NPT on the condition that they will not pursue uh, nuclear weapons. And theor theoretically, let's forget about politics. Theoretically, do you think it's possible to get uh, nuclear technology first because you promised that you will not pursue nuclear weapons? And then you get out of the uh, agreement, contract, and now we are out of this, so we can develop nuclear weapons. Is this possible? So this is a, uh, it's possible because they are doing that, but is it okay? So, so one of the important issues being discussed in the NPT is that, is it possible for a member, a party to NPT, to come out of it? There is no uh, clause in the NPT specifically giving uh, conditions for this. There is a vague uh, uh, wording about it. It's not too good. So every NPT review conference, the formula they are doing now is uh, they, the, the chair, chairman of NPT review conference is holding North Korea's country name plate under his custody. That means they are not, they have not yet uh, uh, endorsed North Korea out of NPT. But North Korea is not coming, so North Korea is not in, in the NPT either. So it's a, it's a very tricky situation. And actually, it's not just about North Korea. I'm not saying this because I'm from South Korea. This issue has a, a great deal of implications for the future of NPT. Because as, as we said, NPT was uh, based on these three pillars. So if we allow member state that acquired nuclear technology because they promised they will not pursue nuclear weapons, if we allow that, if we let them get out, then a lot of countries will, will follow suit. What if the Iran tomorrow announces that we are out of it? So don't talk about it. Don't talk about I, IA safeguard NPT obligations anymore because we are out of it. Is it okay? Probably politically it's not okay, but I guess we are talking about legally, right?
I like to ask what the UBS is. This one. I might take this one. On this one, there's a discussion. Of course, it's, it's of course a vexing question that you uh, well, know that we're, we're working on precisely on how to handle it. It's not okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> First, yeah, the answer is very clear. It's not okay. So how do you handle that? Or the way that is why we are there were there are initiatives and reflections on precisely what are the you know, how we, of course we have the the implication of the sovereign rights to withdraw from a treaty. But if you but withdrawing from a treaty doesn't exonerate you from the obligations you are subject to were subject to under the treaty anyway. So if you have committed a violation under this treaty, you're still liable for those violations even even if uh, even if you withdraw. That's you interpreting. <laughs> 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 and we to and we can, uh, and there are ways to, uh, to formulate and encapsulate that nice formulations. But if you have, if you are part of a treaty, then you, uh, you commit a violation, you, the violation is not, there is no, you're not exonerated just because of withdrawal. <coughs> the obligation stands. Two very quick ones on, on, on this. Is there a NATO uh, principle, I mean, that once, in a, when the state of war commences, uh, uh, the, uh, the obligations are on hold. Uh, 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 NATO keeps, uh, or has kept, making this point at times. I don't know if, if, if that is enshrined in any of the principles. With regard to uh, North Korea, uh, uh, the, the six, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the points the six uh, talk about is the resumption of the, uh, uh, or uh, resumption of NATO, uh, Korea's membership of, yeah. of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the NPT, which sort of implicitly accepts the fact that it has accepted that North Korea has withdrawn. I mean, there is a language uh, problem there uh, uh, in some ways in the in the negotiations of the six. But anyway, that's not to do with the NPT. We're not party to this. Yeah, yeah. But under question, no, I think I think that's a it's a sort of question. Of course, yeah. all of this is. Uh, all, the, all, all, these, all the, these instruments, international instruments, operate in the context of international strategic situations that are rather rivalries, which doesn't mean that they're they, that they are not useful or, uh, or relevant. On the contrary, because the more you have uh, international regimes, or regional regimes, <coughs> that provides some sort of some sort of constraint, some sort of rules of the road, so to speak. The more difficult it is. Difficult it is to, 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 to go around them and do what you want. If you are a great power, you can. <coughs> but at the end of the day, it's not the same situation that if you have nothing at all. And I think it's quite critical for uh, a region such as Southeast Asia, precisely, to have this kind of instrument to be part. To have a, a we call a guarantee that strategic realities are still there, but at least an instrument not to be in play. So that's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. And I do think that um, having uh, a Southeast Asian nuclear weapons reserve with the support of the five United states is something that will contribute a lot to the management. Well, I don't think, I don't know if there is a, tra is, uh, there is a strategic competition you know, between the US and China, I don't know. But at least that would be a key instrument in avoiding that. So, so certainly, uh, I think that's very important. As to your second point on what is the implication of uh, external, really, of external well, well, there is a there is a postulation that the United States is uh, is weakening. That's that's a, that's a postulation. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it is what. Okay. Um, um, yes, Mr. Uh, yeah. you. So you're from the ISAS. So you made a mention of uh, India's exemption from the NSG guidelines. And you know, following that, several countries have signed civil nuclear agreements mm -hmm. with India, including your own country. Mm -hmm. And uh, now Japan has negotiations with India. And one of the sticking points is Japan refuses to accept uh, India's voluntary and unilateral moratorium on nuclear weapon testing, 
Don't you think uh, the unilateral and voluntary moratorium is consistent with this exemption from NSC guidelines? And also, don't you think it's consistent with the spirit, if not the letter, of NPD? And a theoretical question is, uh, is extended deterrence or nuclear umbrella consistent with the letter or spirit of NPT at all? Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was, <coughs> for me, quite an ex extensive Next. Sort of learning reason to do it. But there are certain anomalies that come up to my mind. You start by talking about Iran. Now, as long as Iraq was attacking Iran, the United States was very happy about it. When it turned around on Kuwait, Nepal, then situations changed. And the story was that this, this guy had WMD weapons of mass destruction, which after millions of lives and millions of dollars proven to be non-existent. So this business uh, is not so much about board, about justice, and I think it's about politics. Now, Iran, as you know, uh, uh, is, uh, has, has always been a traditional enemy, not an enemy, but something that the United States does not like because of its own experience, uh, with Iran, which has been wrong over the years. Countries entitled to its own power and its own politics. But the elephant in the room in the Middle East that puzzles me is that nobody's asked Israel, have you got a nuclear weapon or not? Have you or not? Yes or no? There's never been a yes, there's never been a no, and everybody has left it as it is. Now, I don't know what I, where, where IPD comes in into this equation. But it seems to be, you know, a complete anomaly there. At the same time, that country has been grabbing land which does not belong to it. Nobody said anything get away from this. You have an agreement, but nobody has pressed on this. So how do you explain all these um, very noble ideas with these very subtle, un, 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 under, underlying and dishonest motivations of uh, powers. Okay, take these two, then we'll have a final two questions later. Take these two. Uh, so, so, so I take your, I take your, com I take your question as a comment and an expression of a position, so, so I don't, so I don't I'm, not a, I'm not in a position to, uh, to, uh, to react to it. So, although, although it, uh, we got the Iraq to Iraq, we have to distinguish with the Iraq to Iraq what happened in 2003 and what happened in 91, because in 91, we did find a clandestine nuclear program. Not in 2003, but in 91 it was there. It was initiated after the Israelis had destroyed the Iraq reactor. Iraq initiated a clandestine nuclear program which had military aims that was documented. That was the UN security, it was dismantled under UN Security Council supervision. So there was a new, so in 91, there was a nuclear weapons program. Workers' capability was not a device, but there were facilities to fabricate. So that's a different point. The other point is a, is, is a political judgment. Also, by the way, 2003, it was France which opposed Iraq. Uh, yes. The French foreign minister made a staring statement on the yeah. floor of the council. Yes. Well, we yeah. the war. Yeah. We support Iraq, we oppose yeah. the war. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, the France is still the nuclear reactor. Going back to this, to, to, to the, uh, the um, um, First, the point on the, uh, the negotiation with the Japanese. I'm not privy to this point uh, whether they uh, had a, 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 we signed a cooperation agreement. Anyway, so, so I think as did the American and the Russians. And, okay. So it's not a. Uh, so it's not for at, at least we at least we, uh, we 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 were in a position to sign the cooperation agreement uh, without this uh, without this provision. So each, each, each country has its own now uh, has its own uh, requirements and considerations. Uh, so that's. Uh, so that's, that's, so that's not a, that's not for us, that's not an issue for us. Oh. Oh, that's an ongoing discussion that, uh, that
that was a, that's a, that's a discussion has been going on on and off at all the refcons about whether the uh, but the uh, nuclear umbrella doesn't it doesn't imply possession. It's a security guarantee. It's a treaty of commitment. It's not a transfer weapon. We, we, do, we don't, we don't, uh, and it's not a specific country for us because we don't have a nuclear umbrella. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it has always been a discussion that all refcons think, does the extent, does extended deterrence, and especially the, more specifically, the issue was, uh, if I remember well, the fact of having NATO planes uh, implement, um, Implementing American weapons was the, that was the, that was the issue. Okay. It was always managed. Yeah. Okay. Are you, Your Excellency? Okay. My name is Tan Lee. I'm a blogger based out of Singapore. Okay. I just want to pick up on the two points from the two gentlemen over there. Okay. France has, all, as we all know, is one of the major players in the European Union, and I think today we we say that France, like Germany, acts primarily through the EU now. Do you ever see a position where France, through the EU, looks at Israel as an example and says, look, we can't and seriously expect us to keep the uh, Muslim world in line if you don't play by the rules? And because Israel, as we all know, has blatantly not played by the rules when it comes to nuclear. You know, it's either, no, no, we, we will not admit, we will not deny and we can steal land that doesn't belong to us, but if you disagree, you're a racist, anti-Semitic. Um, will the EU, the French, who have been known to have a more pragmatic policy than the Americans, ever say, sit them down and say, look, if you want European support, you've got to play by the rules, sign up with the NPT, which incidentally is something that Iran has done. My second point leading on to that is, will there be a position, and I'm, glad the uh, ambassador of South Korea is here, but you know, we've had a situation where North Korea has openly, you know, struck, made, tested nuclear weapons, have made it quite clear they're willing to attack any, the two big Asian allies of the, U the West, which is South Korea and uh, Japan, and everybody seems very eager to negotiate with North Korea, which wasn't the state with Iraq, you know, it was, so it's a lot of people in Asia are saying that things like NPT, and I don't want to get involved in north-south issues, but it, it is a north-south issue. What we're saying is when you're, the Western world will only enforce all these nuclear treaties against people who only talk about WMD, and they won't do anything with people who actually have WMD and have made it clear that they intend to use it. How would, how would, do you see the EU, the French or the EU, taking a leadership role in correcting this? Well, the EU and the French, we thought, so you, you mentioned the Middle East, we support very much uh, the concept of, uh, of a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. So we are very, we all for it. We are great to support all initiatives going in this direction. We are, we are in favor of the international instruments, which, uh, help, uh, which help precisely address the questions which you, which you and I think there are no soft issues. Proliferation, uh, uh, proliferation breakout effects. Uh, if, if to the extent these categories are uh, these categories are relevant, uh, they, they affect some countries more than they affect us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellency. My name is Joseph. I run an investment business. I naturally favor a war of key security and prosperity. Uh, allow me to offer you a piece of information uh, before I ask a question. Uh, you may like to know that uh, Warren Buffett, even before September 11, had sponsored a retired American general uh, in the pursuit of non-proliferation of nuclear knowledge. Uh, if, if I have your contact details you know, later, uh, perhaps I can meet you and, and give you more information about that. Uh, Having grown up with James Bond's movie, you know, I cannot resist asking you, uh, do you have any intriguing personal security uh, you know, experiences that's like a mini James Bond type? Oh. <laughs> I'm just a diplomat, you know, we do fascinating lives, but not in this, uh, not in this, uh, not in this field. I've been to strange places in my career, but I'm not to do this. Uh, He's a handsome James Bond. <laughs> 
I'm tempting you. I love to, but no, I think I'm much, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a much duller, duller character than that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you, you give me, uh, you, you, you're really tempting me a lot. <laughs> but but regarding, regarding his question about uh, asking if to sign MPT, I was wondering whether you meant you want Israel to sign NPT as a nuclear weapon state or mm. non-nuclear weapon state? <laughs> and the same goes for India and Pakistan. If they sign NPT, they sign as a nuclear weapon state or nuclear non-nuclear weapon state. Because nuclear weapon state, according to NPT, they can keep possessing nuclear weapons. Non-nuclear weapon state promise not to develop nuclear weapons. So if these three countries, they never signed NPT, if you want them to sign it, you want them to sign as nuclear weapon state or non-nuclear weapon state? I think that's a good question here, um, but I think it's, I think they should actually just declare, I mean, India and Pakistan already have nuclear weapons, we all know they have nuclear weapons, the Israelis, I think we've, it's been an open secret, we all know they have nuclear weapons, so sign it as a nuclear weapon state. So. As a nuclear as weapon? As a weapon, it's just... That's a very big... <laughs> 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 yeah, this, this will open up a hornet's nest, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. then you see other states will probably come. I mean, uh, no question is easy, and just because there is a problem does not mean there is a solution. Uh, one little thing that we glossed over a bit, though, we, you, you mentioned it en passant, which is the FNCT. I mean, this is another negotiations which, is, uh, which has reached an impasse uh, also because of two Asian states, not two Asian states, it's one Asian state which has taken a very uh, major position on this. Uh, usually all decisions in the conference and disarmament is, of course, by consensus. And Pakistan makes the point that the uh, the uh, the point in cutoff should be from now on. I mean, you know, in in other words, uh, Pakistan should not be as at a disadvantage vis-à-vis uh, -vis India in this case. Uh, uh, in, in in terms of uh, from what type point in time is the treaty to be effective, and therefore they have you. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, accidentally mentioned FMT at one stage. Uh, 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 but this is what is uh, Pakistan proposing, a fissile material treaty yeah. rather than a cut-off cut yeah. uh, cut uh, cut treaty. But So this is just to add to, the, uh, to this debate, this is a major thing. Anyway, I think we have come to the end of it, which is a very, very uh, 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 interesting discussion. Uh, uh, you have raised some very important points, responded. Uh, as well as one could uh, under the circumstances to many of those. Uh, 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 but some of these human aspirations, oddly enough, I, uh, we talked of uh, the CD, the Conference on Disarmament, and this is located in Geneva. Uh, Voltaire, who lived in Geneva, once said of the Beaumont, of, of the upper classes in Geneva, that uh, he said, La matin je fais de projet, le soir je fais de sorties. In the morning, I make good resolutions. In the evening, I commit follies. So let us hope that all these aspirations do not come to this pass, that they become follies in the evening at the end of the day. With these words, Ambassador, I want to thank you once again on behalf of ISAS for your evening. And as a token of our appreciation, two books for you. You're all invited to uh, a tea reception where we can continue some of the discussions.